welcome everybody to our Surgical Technologist Roundtable. We are so excited to have you. I'm Viv, Social Media Content Specialist for Concord Career Colleges. Uh, We're so excited to get into this great conversation. We are joined uh, by three Surgical Technologist experts that we have uh, across the various campuses uh, throughout the nation, uh, Nicole, Luis, and Andrea. I'm going to kick us right off with our first question. Um, We'll start with Nicole. Could you please tell us about where you've been in your career and uh, what drew you to this field? What drew me to the field is a very interesting story. I was actually working as a behavior specialist um, with mentally disabled adults and children. And I had a bad day at work. On my way home, I drove past a school and they had an open house so i went there and looked at all the programs and they showed me the surgical technology lab and i was just completely mesmerized by the fact that i could go to school for one year and become certified have a degree and work in the or sign me up and they did and i started school i believe two weeks after i signed up um after that i went after i graduated i worked in the main or for a while and did all kinds of specialties my favorite was orthopedic surgery um (laughs) right and then i actually ended up working for an orthopedic surgeon as a private scrub his scrub and i did that for a while and on the side, the school that I graduated from contacted me and wanted to know if I would be interested in teaching part time. And I'm like, I like education. I like the field. Sure, why not? So I started teaching part time in the evening. I really fell in love with teaching and sharing my my knowledge, but still be in the OR. And from there, I went into full time teaching and part time scrubbing to being an in house instructor, didactic instructor, to becoming a clinical instructor, to becoming a clinical coordinator, to move into the program director position. And I worked at the school I graduated from for about nine years. And then I went to Concord. I've been with Concord now for 12 years, um, program director. I did still scrub. I work for LifeLink as a organ procurement specialist, and I did that for a while, and that's pretty much where I was, where I've been, and where I am right now. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Luis, I'm going to kick it over to you. Uh, tell us about your your journey in your career and what drew you to this field. Well, this was kind of a, a natural progression for me. It's almost, you can say it was destiny. And the reason why I say that is I've been in the OR since I've been 19 years old. I was an orderly. And so I got to watch all these, you know, surgeries, drew me to orthopedics, like Ms. Nicole said. And so I was always excited about that. And then one day my wife says, hey, buddy, I'm pregnant with your first child. And I'm like, oh, boy, I got to get some more money coming in. And the reason why I say it's destiny, because at that time, the hospital decided that they wanted to run a program to hire from within. And so we went through a whole interview process. And of course, I had the inline way of getting there because I worked in the OR already. So I did the interview process. We went to school. For nine months, I pretty much had a job waiting for me, right? And my students hate when I tell this story, but the best part about it is I went to school full time and got paid full time. So that doesn't happen, right? So this was, you know, like I said, it was, I guess, a natural uh, progression for me. Um, Then my wife decided that we needed to move to Florida. Uh, (laughs) I wasn't given much option. Uh, So then we moved to Florida. I got hired at uh, Fracture Care at Avon Health Orlando. And part of the training process is you have to spend two weeks in SPD. And while I was there, I had 10 years of experience already and Lincoln students were there and they, you could see the excitement, you know, they're learning. And so I just naturally progressed over and said, hey, 
let me show you guys a little bit about what you're dealing with, you know, because you're students and they got a couple years of experience on you. And it was a great conversation. It was a fun time. They went back and told their instructor all about me and she seeked me out. And here I am giving it to our future healthcare workers. In front of us. I love that. I love the the testimony of of the students and the role that they played in your career. That's awesome. Um, Andrea, same same question. Uh, tell us a little bit about your career and again, what drew you most to this field? So um, I've been around for a really long time. Um, I actually uh, graduated high school in the late seventies and decided um, I decided I was going to be pre med and go to University of Washington and. I needed a break a couple years in. I was not super happy with everything, so I kind of needed a job and I was actually hired by a little local hospital to work in SPD. So I had no idea about surgical instruments. I mean, I always thought I wanted to be a surgeon, but I didn't know anything about the instruments or anything like that. So um, they hired me and one day I had an opportunity to actually observe a surgery. And it changed my life because I thought, oh my gosh, what is she doing? What is she passing? What is going on? I, I have to do this. She's a rock star. I have to do that. So I found a school in Seattle and back then we were surgical technicians. So I went nine months, like three months in the classroom and six months in the hospital. And then I was certified and I'm so fortunate to have picked a program that was K okay, HIPAA accredited because I knew nothing about any of that. So I was able to take the CST with paper and a number two pencil to fill in the little circle in 1984 when this took place. Um, but I ended up um, working at my clinical site and I was really just ecstatic. I loved my program director and she kind of put a bug in my ear and kind of told the other students as well, you know, if all the good techs, if you're really good, you scrub open heart. So I thought, okay, I'm, I'm going to do that. That's, that's what I want to do. I have to do that. So um, within a couple of years, I was actually able to get on a heart team and, and do that. Um, at that point, I ended up moving from Seattle to Atlanta. And I spent, gosh, most of my career in Atlanta. Um, I became a first assistant in Atlanta as well, and this was on the job training before there were any schools or any programs. Um, so um, I spent about close to 25 years total in the OR um, with 10 as a first assistant. So um, it, it was truly amazing. Um, two years I worked for a heart surgeon, which never worked so hard in my entire life as I did with him. Um, <laughs> I think I saw him more than his wife saw him, but um, I really learned a lot and it's my favorite thing to scrub and my favorite thing to teach and the students hate it because, <laughs> because I like the heart so much and I'm always going into more detail than what they really need and they're like, oh, she's talking about the heart again. Oh my goodness. But you know, it, it is what it is. Um, but I have been a CST for 35 years and um, never went to medical school. I finished pre-med. Um, I actually went through the acceptance process to medical school, but decided not to go, that I wanted to be a first assistant in a search tech. And I actually left the OR in 2007 and started teaching and never looked back. Um, I started out as a full-time faculty person and just scared to death, scared to death to teach. But I've got the heart of a teacher and I've Felt like a teacher since I was a little kid, so um, I just I, I just love it. And when the light comes on over the student's head and they understand, I'm like, I'm in heaven. So um, I kind of wish, and I don't know about y'all, if you kind of wish that you were back in the OR a little bit and scrubbed some and all of that, I do, I do too, but um, I'm, I'm really happy that I chose the path that I did. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I think something that, that we all have in common is that you know, your careers might have started off somewhere else and then like maybe a life event happened or you you found your your real draw to this field. Um, and I think that that speaks volumes of our program and, and how we collaborate with our students and, and how we really um, inspire them within the healthcare career field. So thank okay. you so much for for sharing that. Um, I do I do want to get into um, you know, what exactly is the role of a surgical technologist? I think um, a lot of people 
maybe don't know or maybe they are getting their information from like really bad drama tv show <laughs> so um, um, <laughs> yes yes exactly yeah. exactly so um actually Lisa, i'm gonna i'm gonna send it over your way if you could describe the role of a surgical technologist and, and what it entails oh, well it's funny andrea that you said that about grades when we have our students coming in the first thing i tell them this is not Grey's Anatomy. These are not any of these shows that you're accustomed to watching. Um, but, you know, our role, there's this big misconception uh, that all we do is pass instruments. Okay? And, and, and that cannot be further from the truth. All right? We are, in many aspects, the surgeon's right hand. Okay? We need to be troubleshooting as well. Um, we need to be thinking about what's going to happen next. Right. We need to be prepared not only for him, but if there's another team member. Right. There's a lot of wants and needs at the surgical field and there's only one person fulfilling those needs. And that is the scrub tech. OK, so, you know, we we meet our patients with empathy, with the first line of defense for them, with the last line of defense for them. And so, yeah, we set up our tables aseptically. We get our instrumentation ready, but we're always switching gears. OK, we're always making sure that everything is going the way it's needed. And here's the little thing that, that a lot of people need to understand about the job that we do. Your surgeon specializes in what he specializes. We scrub in multiple specialties. OK, so there's comes a time when you see something happening and your experience kicks in, in which you can suggest to your surgeon, hey, this is Don't what I've that. seen here or hey, you may not want to do that or, hey, have you heard of this instrumentation or such and such? OK, so our knowledge and what we bring to the table, it's a whole lot. OK, we do a whole lot more than just pass instruments. So, you know, just be clear on that. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. And Nicole, it kind of seems like you you wanted to add on to what Luis uh, was mentioning just in terms of like what you've seen and, and the expertise that you can bring to the OR. Um, I, I completely agree. People don't realize that we know the surgical procedures just as well as the surgeon. Sometimes even better if it's a new surgeon. Sure. Um, honestly, but we have to be able to to anticipate to know what's coming next. And people don't realize how much we really do in the OR. A lot of times surgeons also bring their medical students mm -hmm. that are here to do a surgical rotation. Well, guess what? They don't know how to scrub. They don't know how to glove. They don't know what's sterile, what's not. They don't know what they can and cannot touch. So as a surgical technologist, we have to have eyes everywhere in the back of our head, on the side. We need to make sure that everybody for the patient safety knows what they're doing because the tiniest contamination can cause a serious infection or even death to the patient. So. And you know what, it, it kind of sounded like there were um, different areas of, of uh, specialties within, within the field, or maybe um, can we expand upon the career path for a, a surgical technologist? I'll, I'll send this one over to, to Andrea. Sure. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so initially, when you come into the operating room as a graduate, um, you start at a, a low rung of the ladder, what we say a clinical ladder, and you can climb that ladder up to. And I know here where I was in my hospitals, we had um, a surgical tech three, and that was basically the highest that they went. And that meant that you had the most years of experience. You could scrub any procedure. You could do anything that came through the door, so to speak. So you were always the ones that had the most experience. Um, I. I know now that there are some accredited first assisting programs out there, so if somebody wanted to take that path and move into that, they can. Um, that's always a great option. Um, I enjoyed it myself. Kind of wish I would have been able to go to school instead of trained on the job because it was a little crazy, a little scary at times, but um, I really like that part. And I think 
if somebody maybe even wanted to specialize and work on a team, they could. Um, I know both Nicole and Louise, they, you know, did a lot of orthopedics. Um, I worked with orthopedic surgeons in Seattle and we had to apply there in the hospital to be on a particular team. And you had to kind of like write a letter of intent and why do you want to be on this team and what can you bring to the team? And and I was thinking, well, these doctors take care of the sonic. So that's what I want to see a basketball player. <laughs> it was my initial kind of um, thing that I wanted to do, but um, we did a lot of fracture trauma there, and I really liked that. Um, some of the hospitals, too, here in the Kansas City area, they they offer only teams. So if you come in, then maybe you, you will specialize. Maybe you'll do ear, nose, and throat, or maybe you will be ortho or something like that. So um, that's, you know, kind of of my sort of um, overview of the progression or um, how somebody might want to kind of progress. I mean, a person can always go to nursing school, right? They can always take their knowledge, take their education and become an RN and an RN that scrubs that went to school to be a surgical technologist because um, OR nurses, they don't learn to scrub and they don't learn to be OR nurses in nursing school. So that's also an option if somebody wanted to do that later on down the road. You can also become uh, a rep. Oh, yeah, yeah, those reps, you know, yeah. if you yeah. specialize in ortho, neuro, uh, they have reps that come in for specific cases mm -hmm. and they actually will only hire somebody that has the OR experience. Mm -hmm. um, they, they will not hire people that have never been in the OR because you have to know what what you're doing in the OR. So that's another sure. and, option. And not only that, I'll just jump in real quick. Something that's been happening out here in, in Orlando uh, that I just think it's amazing. And it's one of the first things that I tell, you know, guys that want to become STs is we are now filling roles that are traditionally set for the nurse, right? We can be coordinators in many different departments. We can basically run the team as the ST. So, you know, before you couldn't do that, all right? Yep. Now we're able to do that and we're kicking down doors. And it's fun to watch. Yes, yeah, team leaders, yeah, absolutely. Actually, that, that brings up a good point. You know, I think um, people don't really understand that, that STs really interact with with everyone uh within within the the hospitals or, or the areas that they're in um you know what are some departments or other roles that they that they interact with and and how do those interactions go like uh, Luis, go ahead you're already on well, <laughs> <laughs> well again like you know on the floors you know sometimes even though we don't do it often you know i still work in the field right and so i think it just brings a different perspective back to school but you know, you know, you may not do it often, but sometimes you have to go to the floor and pick the patient, especially if you're on call, right? Because there's more of a skeleton crew. It's just you and two other people. Um, so you have to go on the floor. You have to interact with those departments. You may have to interact with radiology, you know, even housekeeping, you know, x-ray. Um, so there's a lot of departments that we interact with. It's not just the, in the operating room, you know, you got endoscopy. Oh, man, the list goes on and on. Yeah, labor and delivery as well, right? Labor and delivery, yeah. yeah. Yep. And the thing is that, you know, we scrub in, we should be able to scrub everything, right? As a, you know how to open up your back table, you know your instrumentation. So if they call you from L and D, hey, you got to know how to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, so be prepared for that. Yeah, absolutely. And just so that people understand, what would you say, and I'll ask uh, Nicole this, what would you say a typical, and I, it may not be typical, but what would you say a typical day in the life for a surgical technologist is like? <laughs> okay, so it is definitely, <laughs> you have to be a morning person because we get started. Um, you will have a different speed once you go into the OR or the hospital. You walk faster. Everything you do has a sense of urgency and you have to be very focused. It's a very high stress environment. Most of the time, there are days where, you know, it, it might not be as stressful, but you will see things in the OR that nobody else gets to see. I always tell people the OR is like Vegas in the hospital <laughs> because the only way you can get into the OR is if you work in the OR or if you're a patient. That's it. 
you can as a regular person, you can go into the hospital, you can walk everywhere and see everything, but you cannot just walk into the OR. There's a reason why it's closed. But once you enter the OR, it's a team effort, never on your own. Um, you have to know, pay attention to detail. And there will be days where you don't get a break. It is not about when you go into the OR, you leave your personal life, everything about you, whether you had a bad day, bad morning, bad anything outside of the OR, you walk in, you become a different person. The focus is on the patient and that's it. And you go until the job is done. It's not where you can say, oh, it's two o'clock. I need to clock out. Not if there is a patient on the bed, not if something happened and you don't have relief, you have to pay attention. So that's pretty much every day in the OR. Long hours and, of standing, right? Long hours of standing. Oh, yes. And, and just, you know, taking oh, care yes. of human beings is hard work. And yeah, I agree with all of that. Absolutely. And Nicole, uh, you know, raises a valid point of the, the high stress or high adaptability component to this career. Um, Andrea, what, what would you say or what is your advice? How, how does somebody who's in this field leave that in the OR and not bring it home? Um, well, um, that's a very good question. Um, I know for myself, one of my, my newer students asked me this the other day. They said, have you ever seen anybody die in the operating room? I said, yes, I have. And one of them was a child. Um, and it, it, you leave your tears on the pillow at home and you cry at home and you decompress and all of that. And um, you just, you have to separate your civilian life from your OR life, if at all possible. I know um, I went through the death of four grandparents while I was working in an OR and I had to leave that at the door and take care of the patient. And you just, I think, I learned over the years how to compartmentalize and just kind of keep things in that part of my brain that I don't access at work. And the more I focused at work, the more I focused on the patients. If I was working privately, the more I focused on my boss and getting him to the next hospital. Um, I didn't think about other stuff. So it helped me quite a bit to do that. Yeah, because it wasn't yeah. always easy. It wasn't always easy. Yeah, it's it's not, you know, it's not an easy field. You're you're not just uh, punching in and out, you know, as they say. Um, Luis, do, do you have any other tips on how, you know, someone can can leave what they experience at the, the OR or, you know, in their day there and then decompress at home? Absolutely. Marry a nurse. <laughs> <laughs> OK, yeah, and I'll tell you, the reason why is my wife is a nurse and I feel like I'm able to do this because we're able to speak to each other and we understand what the other person is yeah. talking about, right? Oftentimes, if you're married to someone who doesn't work in the medical field, it's intriguing to them, right? And so they, oh, oh so what happened today? And, and they're curious and, and that's all phenomenal, but sometimes you just don't want to talk about it, right? So it, it just it, it's just a balancing act. And Andrea brings up a great point about compartmentalizing what's going on, leaving that at work. But here's the thing, guys, if you lead with empathy, to your job, things get a lot easier because that's why you're there. You understand why you're there. That's not saying that un unfortunate things aren't going to happen, but I think you already kind of set the tone for saying, you know, I know why I'm here. This is what we're here to do. Give this patient a better life if possible. And, and, and you have to be okay with the result, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. You can Having that, that that good support at home mm -hmm. and someone who understands, you know, this is hard or it was a hard day or, you know, you'll have good days as well. But having that is is critical. Um, Nicole, if you could please speak to because you had mentioned this before, what sort of changes do um, surgical technologists need to adapt to within the OR? Like what are some examples and, and how can they best adapt to that? Oh, there are so many things you have to adapt to in the OR uh, from <clears throat> different personalities. Um, the best example probably is everybody tells you you have to be a type A personality to work in the OR. Well, everybody that works in the OR is a type A personality. So there is high, strong 
<laughs> I'm right. My yeah. way or no way. So you have to learn how to work with with everybody. Um, then you have uh, in, every day is a learning experience in the OR. I don't care how long you've been working in the OR. Every day you go to work, you will learn something else, whether it is a new instrumentation, whether they uh, bring in cadavers to to try out a different or a new instrument to now the robotics. It's it's just a continuous learning, but I think the biggest is. How to work with all the di the personalities. And and focus on the patient and not make it a uh, personal. Um, I always give my students a Q-tip. And I said, you know, whenever you get upset, you should look at the Q-tip. Q-tip stands for quit taking it personal. <laughs> it's not about you. It's down. about the patient. <laughs> it's it, and I learned that from my instructor when I went to school because again, I'm German, so. I don't like it when, you know, people yell at me. I'm the one that should be doing the yelling. <laughs> so, so I would, I, even I would get upset while I was a student of how, you know, when a surgeon would, would start yelling and my instructor said, you know what? Think of a Q-tip, quit taking it personal. If they yell, there is a good reason for it. Doesn't necessarily mean it's something you did. It's right. something is going wrong with the surgical procedure. The patient is crashing. It, it could be so many things and to learn how to balance it and to adjust. I think is probably. One of the most important skills we all have to have. So can I add a little something? I was just thinking of something that my mother used to tell me and um, she would always tell me just be a duck and I'm like, ma'am, she's like, Paddling like hell underneath, smooth as glass on top, gliding. Nobody sees your little feet moving, right? But I think that's what we do every day, you know, because yeah. we always have to be ready for, you know, and I think that the big term the last couple of years has been pivot. We have to pivot, right? So we have to make changes and we have to adapt and just roll with whatever comes our way, you know? Absolutely. And, um, you know, we, we kind of mentioned, you know, starting in different areas of, of a different career, maybe, or, or finding your way to your passion with, within this industry. Um, what is what is something that you wish you knew when you first started this career? Well, we'll we'll kick it over to Luis, and and then we'll go around. <laughs> hmm. Two things. I, I, it's ironic, but I wish that this forum, what we're doing here, was available back then, right? Because if I knew the avenues that I could travel from surgical technology, oh man, my road would have been that much better, more phenomenal, understanding that, hey, I could have become a first assist, a PA, a nurse, even a doctor, if I wanted to invest the time, right? But we didn't really have that. I got the job and it was right to work, go to ortho, go do what you gotta do. So I didn't have an understanding of where I can leapfrog to. Right, because this is an amazing foundation already within itself. It's a great career by itself. But if you want to do more and you want to educate yourself more, there's that opportunity. And I I didn't have access to that. And the other thing is now it's a little bit different, but back then I wasn't required to be certified. So, you know, I went almost six or seven years without being certified. So monetarily I left a lot of money on the table. So I wish I would have known that. And the stress of taking that test seven years <laughs> later, guys. Hey, listen, let me tell you, the passing score was 118, and your boy got 118. Okay, I walked out of there certified and happy. Yes. But, you know, it's important. <laughs> you got to get it, take that test as soon as you finish. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, Nicole, what is something that, that you wish you would have known early on in your career? Uh, I am... Um, well, one is definitely I'm in the same boat back when I went to school. We did not sit for the certification and we were told, well, if you do want to take, you know, your certification, work in the field for a couple of years. Oh. Mm -mm. No, I am so glad that in today's world, in today's school, 
the majority of accredited school, you take your certification before you walk out on your last day. And I think it's so imperative for students to be aware because taking that exam, I only took it once. I will, I will not take it again. <laughs> I will keep up my certification through CEUs, through continuous learning, to staying on top of everything, because there is certain things that you learn in school, like the microbiology, uh, little things that you just don't review while you're in the OR, so it makes it even harder. So that's one. Two, um, Again, I think with the avenues, everything, all the possibilities, and especially also like your, your state assemblies mm -hmm. to how to be involved with, you know, you're not just a surgical technologist working in that OR. You do want to become involved in, in your entire community. That's by getting involved with your state assembly, um, get to know everybody, go to your national conferences. There's so many things out there that that just make you the individual more marketable as well as you grow older, as you, you know, want to move up. And we didn't know that we didn't get that information when we went to school or when I went to school. Yeah, absolutely. And Andrea, what, what is something that you wish you knew when you had first started your career? I wish um, initially that I had spent more time talking to the actual college about accreditation and about the certification because I took it as soon as I got done. We were we were required to do it, so I did it, and um, I'm really glad I did. And unlike maybe y'all, I take it every four years. <laughs> <laughs> I do, and now I think we're down to two year cycle. But I do yeah. when I started teaching. I kept up. I keep up through CEUs as well. But um, I want to see what's on the test because I teach. <laughs> so I want to see if the yeah, question the style has changed. I know that does that. That is crazy. I, I mean, and I'm always trying to get 100% on the test Absolutely. because it's a matter I, I should do well. I better not miss a whole bunch. <laughs> <laughs> then maybe your girl needs to hang up her teaching ad if that's the case. <laughs> um, but I, you know, um, yeah, I really didn't understand the gravity of the career that I chose and what my future could look like when I started. I think I was 22 years old. I'm dating myself now, guys. Sorry. But, you know, I was I was a kid in the operating room and um, I really I was just going day to day and making some money so I could get an apartment. And I was, you know, but I, I wish I would have known more and maybe been a little more informed about, you know, the possibilities and just what being a CST would mean for my future. I think we all sort of relate to that. I mean, no matter the industry, we all wish we we knew more and, um, you know, just hindsight is 2020. Um, but it sounds like you all have some pretty good stories. I would love to hear uh, just one story from each of you about what has been the wildest moment that you have experienced in your career. Let's let's start with Luis and then we'll go oh, around. Boy, let me tell you, I was one year in and, you know, as an ST, you're taught to stay organized, clean up your stuff and whatnot. And so I was finishing up a thyroidectomy with Dr. Smith and he was doing a continuous suture um, and he asked me to tag the end of the uh, monocryl, you know, to give him a little weight and to ensure that the suture didn't come through because he wasn't going to tie a knot, in which I did. And as he's finishing up, you know, he cuts the needle, guys. And here I am, Mr. Lewis, cleaning up. And I pull the, moth, the, the, <clears throat> the mosquito to <laughs> clean up and pull the whole suture right back out. And the patient's wound just opened right back up. And boy, he looked at me and he started laughing, oh, hysterical <laughs> laughing. Okay, he said to me, I bet you'll never do that again. You're absolutely right. I will never do that again. So that's just one of the wildest things that's happened in the operating room. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love that. I kind of love that he laughed. And... Yeah, oh, trust me, I was <laughs> scared. <laughs> I'm hold up first. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Luisa's, um, you know, making like Beetlejuice happen over here. But um, uh, Nicole, would love to hear your your wildest moment. 
the wildest, I mean, I have so many, but I think the wildest was we had uh, heads delivered to the OR for a new sinus procedure. So everybody was excited. I was excited and I was like, oh, yes, which, you know, as soon as you open the box and you have head sitting, just the head of a human being sitting in a box, my stomach dropped immediately. And then, you know, you have to defrost it That's until fine. the surgeon can do the, and then trying to figure out how to hold the head on the bed for them to do the sinus procedure with a new instrument. And I, I think when the doctor came in, she could see uh, my eyes that I was about to ready to just pass out or something because I was like, it keeps rolling from one side to another. And it, it was just, it, so sh she made it very, she made it light of the whole thing because, you know, it. those are the moments where, where do you see this? But I think that was, yeah, she just uh, asked for some duct tape and we duct taped the head to the table so that we could do the procedure. And I just, Lord. that Lord. is probably, I'm, I was used to, you know, you get like shoulders and, and knees and stuff for orthopedic, but yeah, that was, that was probably the wildest experience ever to have heads delivered to the OR. Frozen well, notes. <laughs> we we know that duct tape is now very versatile for for many things. So yes, one one learning that we can take from that. Um, Andrea, definitely would love to hear one of your uh, uh, wildest moments. So there's no cadavers for my story. Um, I was actually probably maybe one of the wild, scary, awesome moments I had was when I was working in Atlanta. I was working privately for a cardiothoracic surgeon and. Wherever he went, I was with him. So if we would be in the ICU or we would go to the OR or whatever. And I got to learn a whole bunch of things uh, by doing that. But we were in the ICU one day um, checking on a post-op patient and the patient coded, flatline, flatline ECG. And he said, open that thoracotomy tray right now. I'm like, uh, okay. And he said, put a blade on a handle. And I did. And we opened up the chest and he said, put your hand in there and squeeze. And I did cardiac massage while he was doing, you know, trying to get the patient stabilized to the point where we could get the patient back over to the OR. So uh, never in my life had I ever thought I would ever feel a human heart or squeeze a human heart or anything else. And it was crazy and fabulous all at the same time. Um, patient did survive, got the patient back to the OR and got everything fixed that needed to be fixed. So, um, but yeah, I, you know, it, it made me really glad that I was working for him and working with him and glad I was with him that day because somebody else would have gotten to do that. And I was really like amazed that he he allowed me to. So that kind of um, transitions nicely into my next question. Would you say that's one of your your proudest moments or maybe do you have another um, one of your proudest moments within your career? Um, I would have to say that's 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 a proud moment for sure. Um, we often got lots of emergencies from the cardiac cath lab and they were trying a new laser angioplasty technique and they were like lasing through the coronary arteries by mistake <laughs> instead of the plaque so we would get patients that were in cardiac arrest and um i remember one day I didn't have time to scrub. I didn't have time to, I, I put on a gown and gloves and that was it. And I put a gown and gloves on him in his suit in the OR cause he, he was not in scrubs. And we, we just, him and I, and we, you know, they threw some betadine on the patient's chest and we opened the patient's chest and got the patient, you know, on the pump oxygenator on the heart lung machine. And at that point I'm working with him and I look up and all across the back wall of the OR, a row of medical students watching us. And this lady survived without an infection. I couldn't believe it. But finally, um, another surgeon came in and assisted him. And I got some help as well, trying to get my back table set up because I had a cardiac tray on a ring stand. 
is all I had at that point. So, you know, it was really, yeah, it was, it was really amazing. I really love that. Wow. Scary, but, but amazing. I was just going to say scary. It sounds scary. Um, Luis, what is, what is one of your proudest moments within your career? Well, I, I think that, you know, we all like to be impactful in anything that we do. And this is one of those fields in which, you know, if you come and prepare to work and you do what you got to do, um, you're going to, you're going to be that. All right. And, you know, the recognition is great. You know, when people are telling me, Hey, great job. I've, you know, I've had doctors say to their medical students, listen, just do what he says to do and you'll be fine, which is great. Right. Cause that means he trusts what I'm doing. But if I had to choose, I think the proudest moment guys, honestly, is as an instructor now teaching and paying it forward because you see how impactful you are in, st in the students' lives. And when they click and they get it, you know, that's just, that's what it's all about, you know? So I'm glad I chose this route of, of teaching. Yeah, you're, you're where you're supposed to be. I like that. Um, Nicole, what is one of your proudest moments within your career? Um, I, I would have to say also what Lewis said. I think the moment when you see that one student walk across stage for graduation, the one that had so many things that lie through at that individual of, you know, giving up or, oh, I can't do it, the doubt in them. And when you see them and uh, the family and, and just everybody being so excited for them, I think this is what what makes a big difference to me. Um, I, I love the OR. I think anytime you work on the patient, you save a patient's life is amazing. Uh, but like, who is it? The, the paying it forward to to see, it's almost like, you know, when you raise your children and then you send them off and you see, wow, look at this. Because when, when I go into the OR now and I see a student that, I don't know, graduated 10 years ago and where they are now, it, it's just, you know, it's like a, a proud mama moment. <laughs> yeah, I am definitely, I think the being in education and being able to share my my skills, my knowledge with anybody. It's and I'm still in touch with my entire class, my very first class I ever taught. I am still in touch with all of them and they're constantly sending me ma messages and it's just one of them is a surgeon. I mean, it's just it's it's just amazing. It's just wonderful. Dope. Yeah, you're you're out there making that impact. Yeah. Um, so we we touched on some cool advancements that you all have seen within your careers and what you have experienced. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about maybe uh, future advancements that you could see happening within the field or or in the OR? Um, you know, any anything that you are aware of that's going to be happening soon or that maybe you didn't have when you had first started uh, your career. Nicole, we're spotlighting you, so go ahead. Well, one is definitely the the Da Vinci. We didn't when when I we didn't have the Da Vinci. I never even thought about the Da Vinci or anything of that form. So Wait, tell I us think, what that is. Tell us what that is first. Uh, so the Da Vinci is a it's a robotic. It's it's like this huge arm, but the surgeon sits is not in the field. The surgeon can actually sit at the console at a different hospital. They can even be in a different country, which is absolutely mind blowing to me. And then the surgical technologists, we put, you know, the arms or mm -hmm. the instrumentation, which we call into the arms, but the surgeon controls them from the consult. And that to me is just, I would have never thought that something like this could ever, ever happen. So if you were to ask me what's the next new thing, I have no idea. I mean, uh, it could be anything. However, the surgical technologist will never be replaceable right. because no matter what, you still have to be the one 
putting the arms in, putting right. the instruments on, making sure the patient is straight, the instruments are there, the equipment is working. So, but I, I don't know what else they can. <laughs> but then I'm not very creative <laughs> with science stuff. So I don't know what you guys think. <laughs> I, I think, you know, you, you hit you hit the nail on the head. Robotics has, you know, been taking the OR by storm, um, and they just seem to be advancing. Uh, you know, in ortho, they do macoplasties, which is a much smaller version of the robotic of the robots. So I think where the focus, um, the bet to better answer the question is the patient outcome continues to get better, right? Because we went from minimally invasive procedures to really good robotic minimally invasive procedures, right? More fine line incisions and stuff like that and dissection. You know, when we do total replacements, it's literally to the line on cuts and everything. So, you know, the patient outcome continues to get to better. Improve. I think, and I think that's the point. That's the point. But she's right. Robotics is taking it by storm right now. Yeah, Andrea, any anything else to weigh in on on the future and the advancements of the <laughs> surgical technologist field? I do know that um, when I graduated from school, the only minimally invasive things that they did is they put a scope in a knee and maybe would do a tubal ligation with the scope in the abdomen. Um, I was um, actually participated um, with the first laparoscopic gallbladder removal in Atlanta when they came out with that. And because prior to that, everybody got a big incision, right? We all got a big incision if your gallbladder was coming out. So it took four hours, that first one, four hours. To <laughs> and everybody was getting seasick with the camera and things. Um, but, you know, as the years went by, it just got better and better. And we were able to do more and more. And, you know, doing, you know, putting a scope in the ventricles of the brain and doing some of the stereotactic things, some of the sinus surgeries and cranial brain surgeries that, prior we couldn't do we can now and you know if somebody has um, a tumor on their acoustic nerve they would almost always lose their hearing but now we have gamma knife you know technology which pinpoints that tumor through a helmet that the patient wears and they can just remove the tumor basically without damaging any of the other structures so i'm sure there's some kind of engineer and physicist out here working Doing on something things. and um in fact i went to a lab here in Kansas City where they are working on new spinal fusion techniques. And these new techniques actually replace all of the old like plates and rods and screws with just one implant only done. Minimally. And it only takes a couple minutes. Yes. And the patient can go home that day. And um, I actually was talking to um, the my tour guide there um, who actually works for Concord and he was telling me that he had seen a patient actually walk into an outpatient surgery center with a walker and leave without needing one. So the patient outcomes, as we said, are just, they're just, things are just getting better and better and better. So it's exciting. It's very exciting. Um, you know, you mentioned the, the excitement about, you know, future advancements within the field. Um, what, what advice do you have for anyone who could be considering this as a career? And Andrew, we'll start with you because you're still on the screen here. Um, as far as um, how to get through school or how to how to think about Any, anything, anything, um, anything, I think be prepared to work really hard, um, be prepared to stand long hours, but be, be prepared to be fulfilled as well. And to make a surgeon's life better that day so he can make the patient's life better. Um, and we have a surgeon on our advisory board that is chief of surgery at our trauma center here in town. And he told me, he said, a really good surgical tech can shave 30 minutes off a case for me, can save 30 minutes. And I think um, if you give it your all and you care about the patient the way the surgeon does, you know, even if you don't know a lot at the time, but you're willing to learn, life is going to be good for you. You know, you're going to enjoy your life in the OR and you're going to feel like you've made a difference every day that you go to work, even if you're tired and hungry when you get home, <laughs> you know, so that would be my advice. Amazing. 
Amazing. Nicole, what advice do you have somebody who is considering this as a career? Um, reach for the stars. They can be yours. Uh, you can accomplish anything you set your mind to it, but you have to do the work. It is not going to be given to you. It is hard work. It takes dedication. Uh, there will be many tired moments or moments where you think, oh, I can't do this, but stick with it because you can. I, I truly believe if you have the compassion and the passion and this is what you want, you can you can reach reach the stars. Louise, same same question. What advice do you have for anyone considering this career? Absolutely. Uh, the one thing I will tell them is this. If, if you're going to make the choice to be here, make the choice to be present. OK, you have to be engaged at every turning point, right? You're paying for an opportunity. You're not paying for something to be given to you. So you have to make sure that you're getting the most out of your education and education doesn't end with school. That is your very basic first uh, introduction to ST. Then when you get to clinicals, it's more education. Then when you get hired, it's more education. And like the girl said, 20 years later, we're still learning. So you have to understand understand that and, ex and set the proper expectations. But if you're not engaged, it's just not going to work. Have to be engaged. And you mentioned that that education component, how it never ends, and, and you always have to be willing to learn more within the field, as we mentioned, all of these advancements that are happening. Um, <clears throat> in your opinion, and Luis, we'll, we'll start with you. This is our final question. What makes Concord's uh, surgical technology program so unique? Um, really, really, it's student-centered success, right? So my students have their ST team, that's fully supporting them, then I'm fully supporting my instructors. Management is supporting me. You know, corporate is supporting management, but we're all facing the same direction, and that's student success, right? Then when you add on uh, your affiliates, who I'm sure we all have open and honest conversations and clear communications about what the expectations are of our students, you know, that is geared towards your patient's success, right? And and if you, if you allow me, I, I have to say this quick story, guys. I'm sorry. You know, I have a student who graduated about, I want to say, three classes ago, okay? And she had some medical stuff going on, and so she couldn't jump right into the field. She had to deal with her, her medical stuff, and everything worked out great. Um, thank God for that. And she came back in and she calls me up yesterday and she says, hey, so tease, I got to tell you something. I said, what's going on? She said, I just got a position as a surgical coordinator for transplant procurement center. And I'm like, wow. Now, mind you, she's had bachelor's degrees from other educational specialties. So I was like, wow, that's amazing. I'm so happy for you. She said, no, no, that's not what I wanted to tell you. I said, okay. She said, I told the guy interviewing me that I'm, I know that I haven't scrubbed in a while because of what's been going on, and I hope that doesn't work against me. He said, you trained at Concord. I know their reputation. I'm not worried about it. You're hired. So in a nutshell, guys, that's what it is. It's all about the student. We support our students. We, you know, we still work in the field, some of us. I mean, everything is just engagement and trying to be successful. And when the student catches on, I tell them all the time, when your confidence level reaches the confidence level that I have already in you, you are going to take off. And when they reach that point, it's a beautiful sight. I mean, it just makes everything worthwhile at that point. You're going to make me cry here. Um, oh, God. <laughs> Nicole, that is such a good story. Nicole, um, what, what, in your opinion, what do you think makes Concord, the Concord Surgical Technologies Program such it, a unique program? I, I agree with Louis. I mean, it is definitely, we are so student oriented. We, we will support our students no matter what. Uh, our, our instructors, take such great pride in teaching and sharing their knowledge. And 
we provide tutoring. We, we will literally go above and beyond to ensure that our students will reach their goal of graduating and gaining a job. Um, I just talked with, I have four students that are taking their CST on Friday. They're getting ready to graduate. And I had a conversation with them today and the smile on their face because all four have a job. That, that, that is, that speaks for itself. When our students have a job before they actually graduate and know they have a job and they're confident, we, we truly honestly care. And we're all a team. It's not just search tech department against another department. We're all together, one team and I think that reflects in our students. Absolutely, and Andrea, we'll we'll end with you. Um, you know, in your opinion, what makes this program at Concord so unique? So this is hopefully my last juncture as far as uh, working in a college or university. Um, I've run a few other surgical tech programs at other schools. I told a mother one day, she said, why should I, my daughter go here? I said, because I'm here and my faculty's here and we will take care of your daughter. We will tutor her if we need to. We will get her help. Whatever she needs, we will work it out and support her. She, We know her name. She's not going to be a social security number on, on the wall with a test score or something like that. It was what they did in the old days when I was in college. We really work hard to make sure that we're delivering the best quality education we can. Amazing. Thank, thank you so much for sharing. Honestly, thank you everyone for, for joining this um, Surgical Technology Roundtable. It was an honest conversation, open conversation. It was so great to hear about your own personal experiences, um, you know, your, your career trajectory, your passion, um, you know, for the industry. Uh, we, we can't thank you enough. This has been fantastic.